Good morning and happy Sabbaths, my brothers, sisters in Christ. Welcome to the online adult sabbatical class for Northwest Houston SDA Church for February 10th, 2024. This is the sixth Sabbath of the first quarter. And this quarter, we're studying how to read the Psalms. Uh, this study was compiled by the Evidence Mission, whose global mission centers help to train people to share the good news of salvation with precious people from other world religions. Uh, let's start as we always do with a word of prayer, because it's always helpful, if not necessary, to get the Holy Spirit involved. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that uh, you inspired through the Holy Spirit uh, the prophets of this world, the people of this world, to write for us a scripture which is historical in nature. And we thank you especially that in the center of this uh, book uh, that we uh, treasure so much, your words, that you put this section of the Psalms, the book of praises uh, for you. Help us as we try to understand uh, the times in which it was written, the direction uh, of the thought, and the meanings of these passages. Uh, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's begin as we uh, always do with a screen share. Here. All right, we're studying now, uh, again, the very center of the scripture, the book of Psalms. And uh, one thing about the book of Psalms, it's a book of, to praise God for what he is, who he is, what he does for us. And um, it's important that we understand uh, meanings uh, as as we read uh, passages, the meanings of uh, different words, uh, the meanings of different phrases in the scripture, uh, because they're not always the same as, as we would think about. For instance, uh, when Jesus comes back, he's going to bring us all crowns. And uh, you often see pictures of what I call the Burger King crown. <laughs> Jesus has a crown on his head. Uh, a metal crown with points on it and jewels. Um, it, there are two types of crowns talked about in the Bible. Uh, one of them is that type of crown. It's called a, a, a conqueror's crown. When, when, uh, when, for instance, David conquered uh, Moab, uh, the king, he took the king's crown uh, because he conquered him, and he was a conqueror's crown. Uh, but there's another type of crown uh, spoken of in the Bible, and that type of crown is a victor's crown. Now, a victor's crown is one given uh, when someone re wins a race, uh, when someone wins a, an election <laughs> and or is appointed to, to a position. That's a victor's crown. Nowhere in the scripture does it ever say that God gives us a conqueror's crown. We're always given all, always given a victor's crown uh, because we are victorious through Jesus, through his blood, through his sacrifice, not anything on our own. And as we read the Psalms today, we're, we're going to see some of that as we study. Uh, God is the one who does everything for us. Um, you know, we can do nothing on our own. And keep that in mind as we study uh, the Psalms today. Our memory verse was, For the oppression of the poor, for the sighings of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he yearns. Again, it all comes from God. Psalms 12, 5. Our age is not the only age in which evil, injustice, and oppression raged. And that's why I like the historical uh, look in the Bible. It's always been there. <laughs> and then nothing new under the sun, as uh, Solomon would say. Uh, the psalmist lived in such a time as well. And so, whatever else they are, the psalms are also God's protest against the violence and oppression in the world. Uh, in our world, and that of the psalmist as well. Yes, the Lord is long-suffering and holds his wrath uh, in his great forbearance, not wanting any to perish, uh, but to repent and change their ways. I remember Second Peter, Peter's last letter, which he wrote after God told him he was about to die. Uh, he said this very importantly, uh, God is waiting patiently. And uh, I'm so glad he did. <laughs> if he'd come back at the time of Peter and, and, and Paul and, and John and the disciples, none of us would have been born. <laughs> 
but he was patient and waited for us. Um, and though God's proper uh, time uh, for his intervention doesn't always coincide with human expectations, the day of God's judgment is coming. Uh, Psalms 96, 13 tells us that. He's waited, he's waited, he's waited, but he's coming soon. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes, he comes to judge the earth. He will <laughs> judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. Uh, 98 uh, 9 also says, Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people with equity. <laughs> we just need to trust in him and in his promise until that day comes. God will avenge. <laughs> he will uh, uh, ju justly judge and mete out uh, uh, his uh, uh, punishment for those only the creator whose throne is founded on righteousness and justice, Psalms uh, 89, 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness uh, go before you. Uh, look at those that fit together. Psalms 97, 2 tells us, clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Uh, so... Only the creator whose throne is found in righteousness and justice can provide with his sovereign judgment, stability, and prosperity to the world. Uh, this twofold aspect of divine uh, judgment includes deliverance of the oppressed and the destruction of the wicked. Psalm 7, uh, 6 to 17 reads this way. Arise, Lord, in your anger. Arise up against the rage of my enemies. Awake, my God, uh, decree justice. Let the assembled people gather around you while you sit enthroned over them on high. Let the Lord uh, judge the, the peoples. Vindicate me, Lord, according to my righteousness, according to my integrity, O Most High. Bring to an end the violence of the wicked and make the righteous secure. You, the righteous God, who probes the minds and hearts, my shield is the Most High is God most high, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge, a God who displays his wrath every day. If he does not relent, he will sharpen his sword. He will uh, build the string of his bow. He has prepared his deadly weapons. He makes ready his flaming arrows. Whosoever is uh, pregnant with evil conceives trouble and gives birth to disillusionment. Whoever digs a hole and scoops it out falls into the pit they have made. The trouble they cause recoils on them. Their violence comes down on their own heads. I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness. I will sing the praises of the name of the Lord Most High. This is what we have been promised, and this is what uh, will indeed one day come true. But in God's time, not ours. A point that the psalmist emphasizes. And again, I say, I'm so glad he waited. <laughs> and I'm so glad he's waiting on my grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I'm so glad that uh, that I was born uh, to live forever with him. How is the Lord portrayed in these texts? And what uh, do these images convey about God's readiness to deliver his people? Remember when the time is right and the time I believe is nearing. Psalms 18, 3 to 18. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise and I have been saved from my enemies. The cord of death uh, entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me and the snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. The earth trembled and quaked. The foundations of the mountain shook. They trembled because he was angry. Smoke arose from his nostrils. Consuming fire came from his mouth. Burning coals blazed out of it. He parted the heavens and came down. Dark clouds were under his feet. He mounted the cherubim and flew and soared on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering his canopy around him, the dark rain and clouds of the sky. 
Out of the brightness of his presence, clouds advance with hailstones and bolts of lightning. So like the judgment of revelations. The Lord thundered from heaven. The voice of the Most High resounded. He shot his arrows and scattered the enemies. With great bolts of lightning, he routed them. The valleys of the seas were exposed and the foundations of the earth lay bare at your rebuke. Lord, at the blast of the breath from your nostrils, he reached down from on high and took hold of me and drew me out of the deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my distress, but the Lord was my support. Again, it was God who did it all. And the psalmist uh, uh, realized that. Psalm 76, 3 to 9 says, There he broke the flashing arrows, the shields and the swords and the weapons of war. You are radiant with light, more majestic than mountains, uh, rich with gain. The valiant lie plundered. They sleep their last sleep. Not one of the warriors can lift his hands. Uh, at your rebuke, God of Jacob, both horse and chariot lie still. It is you alone who are to be feared. Who can stand before you when you are angry? From the heavens you pronounce judgment, and the land feared and was quiet. When you, God, rose up to judge, to save all the afflicted of the land. Uh, God is, God is going to do the judgment very, very soon, and all the universe will stand by in awe. Psalms 76, uh, uh, 9. <clears throat> he breaks the spirit of the rulers, uh, and he is feared by the kings of the earth. Psalms 144, uh, 5 to 7. Part your heavens, Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains so that they smoke. Send forth lightning and scatter the enemy. Shoot your arrows and rout them. Reach down your hand from on high and deliver me and rescue me. Uh, from the mighty waters, from the hands of foreigners. So these hymns of praise uh, before uh, the Lord. So these hymns praise the Lord before uh, for His awesome power to overcome evil forces that threaten His people. They portray God in His Majesty as a warrior and judge, the image of God as a warrior. Frequently, the Psalms and the highlights the severity and urgency of God's response to His people's cries. Uh, and sufferings. It's now no different in the Old Testament and the New Testament. God will judge, and that judgment is coming soon and swift, and it will be final, and there'll be no changing it. Uh, here are just some uh, passages taken out of Psalms 18, uh, 13 to 15. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of uh, fire. Uh, he sent out his arrows and scattered his foe, lightning in abundance, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. And that's, the sea always re refers to peoples, populations. The foundations of the world were uncovered. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of your breath of your nostrils. So God will do all the judging. We don't need to judge. And Jesus talks about it over and over again. It's for the Father. A sheer determination and magnitude of God's actions should disperse any doubt about God's great care and compassion for the sufferings or about his ability to defeat evil. We just need to wait for him to do it. Be patient. In the end, even when God's people, such as David, were involved in war, deliverance did not come from human means. Uh, in his many battles against the enemies of God's people, King David praised God as the only one who had achieved all the victories. It would have been easy for David to take credit for what happened, for his many successes and triumphs. But that is not uh, his frame of thought mind. He knew where the source of his power came from, from an earliest age when he, when he killed that lion and that bear, defending his, he knew that it was God's hand. <clears throat> Although David states that the Lord trains his hand for war, Psalms 18, uh, 34, he trains my hand for battle, my arm can bend the bow a bow of bronze. Nowhere in the Psalms does he, David, uh, rely on his battle skills. Instead, the Lord fights 
for David and delivers him. 18 uh, uh, continues on in 47 to 48. He is the God who avenges me, who subdues nations under me, who saves me from my enemies. You exalted me above my foes. From a violent man, you rescued me. <clears throat> David gives all the credit to God. Uh, all the great people in the Bible did. And we <laughs> need to give God all the credit today. <clears throat> in the Psalms, King David, who was known as a successful warrior, assumes his role as a skilled musician and praises the Lord as only the deliverer and sustainer of his people. And these musical pieces that we see in the psalm are so beautiful. Psalm 144, 10 to 15. To the one who gives victory to kings, who delivers his servant David from the deadly sword, deliver me, rescue me from the hands of foreigners whose mouths are full of lies, whose right hands are deceitful. Then our sons in their youth will be like well-nurtured plants, and our daughters will be like pillars carved to adorn the palace. Our barns will be filled with every kind of provision. Our sheep will increase by thousands, by tens of thousands uh, in our field. Our auction will draw heavy loads. There will be no breaching of walls, no going into captivity, no cry of distress in our streets. Blessed is the people to whom uh, this is true. Blessed is the people whose God is the Lord. Remember, uh, the word God Elohim means plural, and the word Lord means singular, our triune God. <clears throat> so again, everything uh, is God's. Everything's in his head. Uh, all we are is the vessels that he fills. Praise and prayer to the Lord are David's sources of strength, which are more powerful than any weapon of war. God alone is to be trusted and worshipped. You know, there are stories in the scripture where the armies never raised a hand, and the enemy was defeated. And that was all to show them that it was in God's hands. Whatever gifts and skills and success you have had in life, why must you always remember uh, the source of them all? Why must we always recognize the fact that God is the source of all that we have, all our successes? And what danger do you face if you forget that source? Good questions for your worship time today. Can you take credit for what goes on in your life? Uh, maybe you put in a lot of time, a lot of effort. Um, should you take credit for that or should you give glory to God? Now, what is the message here uh, for us even today? And we'll have some, some nice Psalms. Psalms 918, but God will never forget the needy. The hopes of the inflicted will never perish. So what's the message there? God, God never overlooks anything. Psalm 12, 8. Because the poor are plundered and the needy groan, I will arise, says the Lord. I will protect him from those who malign them. Again, God, their protector, our protector. Psalms 40, 17. But as for me, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. So God is God is there for us. Uh, we just need to put our trust in him and wait. Psalm 113, 7. He rises, he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy uh, from the ash. Again, God does it all. Psalm 146, 6 to 10. <clears throat> he is the master of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful. How long? Forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. And righteous means those who live rightly. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. And he frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Psalm 41, 1-3. to Blessed are those who have regard for the weak. The Lord delivers them in times of trouble. The Lord protects and preserves them. They are counted among the blessed in the land. He does not give them over to the desire of their foes. The Lord sustains them on their sickbeds and restores them 
from their beds of illness. Remember Jesus said, uh, we need to take care of those who are hungry and thirsty and in need of clothing and need of housing. And that comes from the Psalms as well. And God exhibits special care and concern for justice regarding the various vulnerable groups of people, including the poor, the needy, the oppressed, the fatherless, the widows, the widowers, and strangers. Uh, the Psalms, like the law and the prophets, are clear on that point. And if we go to the law, which was found in Exodus 20, or Exodus uh, from 22, uh, 21 to 27, it says, Do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner, for you were foreigners in Egypt. Do not take advantage of a widow or the fatherless. If you do, uh, and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. My anger will be aroused, and I will kill you with a sword. Your wives will become widows, and your children fatherless. If you lend money to one of my people among you who is needy, do not treat it like a business deal. Charge no interest. If you take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, return it at sunset. People used to sleep under their cloaks. That was their blanket. <laughs> so that's that's what he's saying here. Uh, so even if you're holding it as a pledge, give it back to him every night so he doesn't freeze. Because a cloak is, is the only covering your neighbor has. What else can they sleep in when they cry out to me? I will hear, for I am compassionate. And God exhibits special care and concern for justice regarding those various vulnerable people groups. Again, uh, we talked about them. Um, Isaiah 3, 13 to 15. The Lord takes his place in court. He arises to judge the people. The Lord enters into judgment against the elders and the leaders of his people. It is you who have ruined my vineyard and plundered the, uh, from the poor uh, is in your house. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor? So God will judge if, if we uh, take advantage of people. Many Psalms use the expression poor and needy and avoid representing the oppressed and exclusively uh, national and religious terms. This, does, uh, this is done in order to highlight God's universal care for all humanity. God doesn't care, it, in this case, God didn't care if you were Jew or Gentile. Uh, you were supposed to be treated the same. Those were the laws. And uh, today we would say, God doesn't care if you're a Christian or a non-Christian. Uh, he treats us all the same. We need to bring the non-Christians into the family, though. The expression poor and needy is not limited to material poverty, but also signifies vulnerability and helplessness. The expression appeals uh, to God's compassion, and it conveys the idea that suffering is alone and has no other help but God. Uh, suffers alone. Uh, the depiction of poor and needy also pertains to one's sincerity, truthfulness, and love for God in confessing one's total dependence on God and renouncing any trace of self-reliance and self-assertion. Meanwhile, caring uh, for the deprived uh, demonstrates the people's faithfulness to God. Psalms 41, 1 to 3, Blessed are those who have regard for the weak. The Lord delivers them in times of trouble. The Lord protects and preserves it. They are counted among the blessed of the land. He does not give them over to the desires of their foes. The Lord sustains them on their sick beds and restores them uh, from their bed of illness. Uh, the evil done against the vulnerable uh, were particularly heinous sins in the biblical culture. And we'll read Deuteronomy again, the second law giving, verses 15, uh, 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 chapter 15, verse 7 to 11. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God has given you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. Be careful not to harbor such wicked thoughts. The seventh year is the year of canceling debts is near, so that you may not show ill will toward the needy among your fellow Israelites and give them nothing. They may then appeal to the Lord against you and you will be found guilty of sin. 
Give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you and all your work and then everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. The Psalms inspire faithful people to rise uh, their uh, voices against every uh, oppression. As we as Christians, uh, we should look into our own congregations, look into our neighbors. Is there someone in need, someone you can help, someone, especially in these times, desperate uh, for food or desperate to pay the rent or desperate for pay the utility bill? There are a lot of people that have a lot of needs right now, and we need to be there as, as, as Christians. <clears throat> the Psalms also underlines the futility of grinding one's confidence, grounding one's confidence on perishable human means as the ultimate source of wisdom and security. God's people must resist the temptation to put ultimate faith for salvation in human leaders, institutions, especially when they are different from God's way. Don't trust the government and don't rely on the government. <laughs> In his grace, our Lord identified himself with the poor by becoming poor himself, that through his poverty, many might become rich. Second Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you uh, know the graces of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, uh, through his poverty, might become rich. Christ's riches included deliverance from every oppression uh, brought by sin. He, uh, and he promised us eternal life in God's kingdom. Jesus Christ fulfills the Psalm's promise as the divine judge who will judge every mistreatment uh, of the depraved as well as neglect the, as, uh, as well as neglect of duty toward them. Matthew 25 that famous passage, Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and he's coming soon, brothers and sisters, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. This story has gone on, the great controversy, since the, the creation week. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Are thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Are needy and clothe you with clothes? Uh, when uh, did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did to one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed. Uh, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. See, humans were not supposed to be destroyed. Uh, the, the evil angels were. Uh, for I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And they will answer, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes? are sick or in prison, and we did not help you. And he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Brothers and sisters, you don't have to break God's commandments uh, to be uh, lost. You need If you are not doing what we need, what needs to be done for those around you. If you're not helping the people around you, uh, you can be lost, even though you are trying your best to keep his commandments. So how much do we think of the poor and the needy among us 
And how much do we do for them? It's a good question. Are you going to be on the right hand or the left hand? Something to talk about today in your devotion time. The Lord has endowed Israel's leaders with authority to maintain justice in Israel. Uh, Psalms 72, 1 to 7 says, Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. May he judge your people in righteousness, uh, your afflicted ones with justice. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people, the hills the fruit of righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. May he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all generations. May he be like the rain falling on the mown field, like showers watering the earth. In his days, may the righteous flourish and prosper, uh, prosperity abound until the moon is no more. For he will deliver the needy who cry out, uh, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence. For precious is their blood in his sight. Israel kings were to exercise their authority in accordance to God's will. The leader's central concern should be ensuring peace and justice in the land and caring for the socially disadvantaged. Only then would the land and the entire people prosper. And the king's throne is strengthened by the faithfulness to God and not by human power. You may read the book of Amos and the book of Jeremiah. And you'll find in both those books, before God carried his people away in captivity, he said to them, your leaders are like a basket of rotten fruit. And uh, because of that, uh, I've taken the nation away from you. So, um, uh, you know, if you're in a place of authority, a position of authority, we need to we need to be honorable and just and followers of God. In Psalms 82, uh, uh, one to eight, we read what happens when leaders pervert justice and oppress the people uh, they are tasked to protect. God provides as a great in the great assembly. He renders judgment among the gods. How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy and deliver them from the hands of the wicked. The gods know nothing and they understand nothing. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods. Uh, you are the sons of the Most High. But you will die like mere mortals. You will fall like every other ruler. Rise up, O God. Judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. Ah, let's see what, what this means about gods. In Psalms 81, uh, 82, 1 to 8, we read, God declares his judgment upon Israel's corrupt judges. The gods in these that we read about in, in verse 1 and 6 are clearly neither pagan gods nor angels because they never uh, were never tasked with delivering justice to God's people and so could not be judged for not fulfilling it. The charges are listed in Psalms uh, uh, in verses 2 to 4. Uh, echo the law of the Torah, identifying the gods as Israel's leaders, people who thought they were gods. <laughs> we get so many people in a position of authority that lord it over everybody. <laughs> they, and, uh, and that's what had happened. Uh, we've talked about that a little earlier. And Deuteronomy 1, uh, verse 16 to 18, it says, And I charged your judges at that time, hear the disputes among your people and uh, judge fairly, whether the case is between two Israelites are between the Israelite and a foreigner residing among you. Do not show partiality in judging. Hear both small and great alike. Do not be afraid of anyone, for judgment belongs to God. Bring me any case too hard for you, and I will hear it. And at that time, I uh, told you everything you were to do. So uh, Moses was re reiterating um, a, a historical uh, fact of the past. Uh, in John uh, 10, verses 33, 35, we read, We are not stoning you for any good works, they replied, but for blasphemy against uh, blasphemy because you are a mere man claiming to be God. And Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I have said to you, you are gods. 
if he called them gods uh, to whom the word of God came, the scripture cannot be set aside. Uh, Jesus was reprimanding these people who had set themselves up as God uh, and judged him. God questions the sons of men whether they are ju they judge justly and their punishment is announced because they have found unrighteousness. Uh, the leaders totter in darkness without knowledge. Psalms 82, 5. The gods know nothing. Their understanding, uh, they understand nothing. They walk about in darkness and the foundations of the earth are shaken. Because they have abandoned God's law, the light and light. Uh, Psalms 119, 105 tells us, the word, your word is the lamp for my feet, a light on my path. <clears throat> the scripture unswervingly holds the view that the Lord is the only God. God shares his governance of the world with appointed human leaders as his representatives. Remember, he's going to make us all kings. <laughs> uh, we will all uh, reign on this earth uh, and reign over this earth. Um, <clears throat> Romans 13, uh, uh, 1 says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Uh, the stories in the Old Testament tell you that. Even pagan leaders God used uh, for his, his good. How often, however, have these human representatives, both in history and even now, perverted the responsibility that they have been given? Uh, how often? Have they turned away from God? Uh, if I had to say, I would say a lot. <laughs> Psalms 82, 1 to 8, uh, mockingly exposed the apostasy of the leaders who believed themselves to be gods above other people. Although God gave authority and privilege to the Israelite leaders to be called children of the Most High and to represent him, God renounces the wicked leaders and God remain, reminds them that they are mortal and subject to the same moral laws as all people. No one is above the law of God. Psalms uh, uh, 82, 6 to 8. <clears throat> God will judge the entire world. God's people, too, shall, be, uh, shall give an account to God. Both the leaders and the people shall uh, emulate the example of the divine judge and place their ultimate hope in him. Now, what kind of authority do others hold over you? Good question for today in your devotion time. And how justly and fair are you exercising that authority? So uh, are you a fair judge uh, to your family or co-workers? If you're a, a, a boss, uh, how are you doing? it? So take heed that we don't make the same mistakes. What sentiments uh, do the psalmist convey uh, and what agent of judgment are in these psalms? Psalms uh, 58, 68. Break the teeth and the mouths, O God. The Lord, tear out the fangs of those lions. Let them vanish like the waters that flow away when they draw the bow and let their arrows fall short. May they be like the slug that melts away uh, as it moves along, like the stillborn child that never sees the sun. Psalm 69, 22 to 28. May the table be set before them because... Uh, become a snare. May it become retribution and a trap. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see, and their backs be bent forever. Pour out your wrath on them. Let your fierce anger overtake them. May uh, their their place be deserted. Let uh, there be no one dwelling in their tents, for they persecute those who wound, uh, who you wound, and talk about the pain uh, of those you hurt. Uh, charge them with crime upon crime. Do not let them sh uh, share in your salvation. May they be blotted out of the book of life and not be listed with the righteous. Psalms 89, uh, 83, uh, 9 to 17. <clears throat> Do to them as you did to Midian, as you did to uh, Sisera and Jabin, at the river Kishon, who perished at Endor and become like dung on the ground. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, 
And their princes like uh, Zeba and Zamuna, who said, let us take possession of the pasture lands of God. Make them like tumbleweeds, my God, like chafe before the wind. As fire consumes the forest or the flame sets mountains ablaze, so pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your storm. Cover their faces with shame, Lord, so that they will seek your name. May they ever be ashamed and dismayed, and may they perish in disgrace. <coughs> but what sentiments do these psalms convey? And who is the agent of judgment in these psalms? Psalm 94, 1 to 2. The Lord is the God who avenges. O God, who avenges, shine forth. Rise up, judge the earth. Pay back the proud what they deserve. Psalms 137, 7 to 9. Remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. Daughter of Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. So God uh, is, is the judge. Some Psalms beseech God to take vengeance on the individuals and nations who intend to harm or who have already harmed. The Psalmist are their uh, people. Uh, these Psalms can sound perplexing because of their harsh language and apparent discord with biblical principles of love for your enemy, which is in Matthew 5, 44. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And many of these texts we've read today uh, do the opposite. Yet the psalmist's indignation in the face of oppression is a good one. It means that the psalmist took right and wrong more seriously than did many people. He cares uh, even greatly about uh, the evil that is done in the, in the world, not just to himself, but to others as well. However, Nowhere does the psalmist suggest himself to be an agent of vengeance. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Instead, he leaves retribution solely to God's hands. The psalms invoke the divine covenant's curse. And Deuteronomy 27, 9-16. Then Moses and the Levitical priest said to all Israel, Be silent, Israel, and listen. You have now become a people of the Lord your God. Obey the Lord your God and follow his commandments and decrees that I give you today. On the same day Moses commanded the people, uh, when you have crossed over the Jordan, these tribes shall stand on Mount uh, Gerizim and bless the people. Simon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And these tribes shall stand on Mount Ebel and pronounce curses. Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulon, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levites shall recite to all the people of Israel in a loud voice, Cursed is anyone who makes an idol, a thing detestable to the Lord, uh, the work of skilled hands, and sets it up in secret. Then all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is anyone who dishonors their father and their mother. And then all the people said, Amen. So, and this implored uh, God to act as he has promised. Uh, these curses and these and these promises. <clears throat> the Psalms are prophetic proclamations about God's impending judgment. They are not solely the Psalmist prayers. The Psalms 137, 1 to 9. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, and there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while we were in a foreign land? If I forget uh, you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skills. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day that Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. And daughter of Babylon, doomed uh, to destruction. Happy is the one who repays 
you according to what you have done to us. <laughs> Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against your rocks. Now this reflects on the announcement of divine judgment on Babylon as seen in the prophets. The devastation of the Babylonians brought uh, to other nations would turn back uh, on them. The Psalms uh, convey divine warning that evil will not go unpunished forever. But their stories, they're true stories. The Bible is all true. <clears throat> God's retribution is measured with uh, justice and grace. God's children are called to prayer for those who mistreat them and even uh, to hope for their conversion. Let them, Psalms 83, 18, let them know that you, whose name is Lord, that you alone are the most high above all the earth. We should pray for enemies so they can get converted. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 7, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you will prosper too. So God asks, even as they've been carried into Babylon, God asks them to pray for the city of Babylon. <clears throat> However, while seeking to fit these Psalms with the biblical norms of love your enemies, we must be careful not to minimize the agonizing experience expressed in them. God acknowledges the suffering of his children and reassures them that Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Psalms 116, 15. Divine judgment obligates God's people to raise their voices against all evil and to seek the coming of God's kingdom in its fullness. The Psalms also give voice to those who suffer, letting them know that God is aware of their suffering and that one day, one day, justice will come. <clears throat> Now, questions for your devotion time today. Who doesn't at times have thoughts or fantasies about vengeance on those who have done them or their loved ones terrible wrong? Good question. And how might these Psalms help you to put such feelings in proper perspective? How can they help you to remember vengeance is God's, not yours? Where does God's judgment take place? And what are the implications of the answer to for us, and how does sanctuary help us to understand how God deals with evil? Remember, judgment is going on in the sanctuary right now as we sit here and stand here. And Psalms 96, uh, 6 to 10, splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families and na of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory due to his name. Bring an offering and come to his courts. Worship the Lord in splendor of the holiness, his holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the people with equity. <clears throat> now, where does God's judgment take place? And what are the implications of the answer for us? And how does the sanctuary help us understand how God will deal with evil? Psalms 99, 1 to 4. The Lord reigns, the nations tremble, and he sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion. He is exalted over all nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. The king is mighty. He loves justice. You have established equity in Jacob, and have done what is just and right. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool, saying, Arise, Lord, and come to your resting place. You are and the ark uh, of your might. <clears throat> may that your priests be clothed with your righteousness, and may your faithful people sing for joy. Psalms 132, uh, 13 to 18. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling, saying, This is my resting place forever and ever. Uh, here I will sit enthroned, for I have desired it. I will bless her with abundant provisions. Her poor I will satisfy with food. I will close her priests with salvation. And her faithful people I will sing uh, 
will ever sing joy. Here I will make a horn grow for David, and I will set up a lamp for my anointed one. And that means a, the horn means a kingdom. I will uh, clothe his enemies with shame, but his head will be adorned with a radiant crown. Now, the Lord's judgment is closely related to the sanctuary. The sanctuary is the environment where the psalmist's understanding uh, of the problem of evil is transformed. Psalm 73, 17 to 20. Till I enter the sanctuary of God, I will understand uh, their final destiny. And then I understand their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They are like a dream where one awakes. Uh, when you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. The sanctuary is designated as a place of divine judgment as indicated by the judgment of Urim. Numbers 27, 21. Remember the Urim and Th Thurim was, uh, Thummim were, were two stones uh, that, that God used uh, to answer questions. He is to stand before Eliezer the priest who will obtain decisions for him by inquiring of the Urim before the Lord. At his command, he will uh, he and the entire community of the Israelites will go out, and at his command they will come in. <clears throat> and the and the respite of uh, judgment uh, of the high priest, uh, Exodus twenty eight fifteen, fashion of respite and make for making decisions, a work of skilled hands, uh, make it like an ephod of gold and blue and purple and scarlet yarn and finally to a linen. And Exodus 28, 28 to 30. The rings of the breastplate are to be tied to the rings of the ephod with blue cord connecting to the waistband so that the breastplate will not swing uh, out from the ephod. Whenever Aaron enters the holy place, he will bear the names of the sons of Israel over his heart and on his breastplate of decision as a continuing memorial before the Lord. Also put the Urim and Thummim, uh, Thummim uh, in the breastplate so that they may be over Aaron's heart whenever he enters the presence of the Lord. Thus Aaron will always bear the means of making decisions for Israel uh, over his heart before the Lord. According to many psalmists, uh, depict God on his throne in the sanctuary ready to judge uh, the world for its sins and evil. At the sanctuary, the plan of salvation was revealed. Uh, in paganism, sin was understood primarily as a physical stain to be eliminated through magic rit rites. In contrast, the Bible represents sin as a violation of God's moral law. God's holiness a means that he loves justice and righteousness, and he wants to set apart. That's what holiness means. Likewise, God's people should pursue justice and righteousness and should worship God in holiness or separateness. Do not uh, uh, to do that. They must keep God's law, which is an expression of His holiness. Thus, the sanctuary is a place of forgiveness of sin and restoration of righteousness, as indicated by the mercy seat and the in God's throne, and the sacrifices of righteousness. Deuteronomy thirty three nineteen. They will summon the people to the mountain and there offer the sacrifice of righteousness. They will feast on the abundance of the seas and on the treasures hidden in the sand. Psalms 4, 5. Offer the sacrifice of righteousness and trust to the Lord. Yet the God who forgives takes vengeance upon the wicked uh, deeds of unrepentant people. Psalm 99, 8. Lord our God, you answer them. Uh, you were to Israel a forgiving God, though you punish their misdeeds. The practical implications of the sanctuary being a place of divine judgment are seen in the constant awareness of God's holiness and demands for righteous living according to God's covenantal requirements. <clears throat> the Lord's judgment uh, from Zion results in a well-being of the righteous and the defeat of the wicked. And we read in Psalms 132, 13 to 18, 
For the Lord has chosen Zion, he desires it for his dwelling, saying, This is the place is my resting place forever and ever. There I will sit enthroned, for I have desired it. I will bless her with abundant provisions for her poor and satisfy with food. I will close her priests with salvation, and her faithful people will sing uh, for joy, ever sing for joy. Here I will make a horn to grow out of for David and set up a lamp for my anointed one. I will close his enemies with shame, but his head will be adorned with a radiant crown. The sanctuary fostered the jubilant expressions of God's coming as a judge, especially during the Day of Atonement. Likewise, the Psalms strengthen the certainty of the impending arrival of divine judgment. Psalm 96, 13. <coughs> Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes, he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. Psalm 98, 9. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people with equity, namely Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Romans uh, 8.34. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Jesus, uh, Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is the interceding for us. So how does this verse show that uh, what Christ is doing in the heavenly sanctuary is good news for his people. He is interceding for us. <laughs> right? Think about that and talk about that today. Uh, here's some readings. Uh, read the Beatitudes, found in Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. Uh, you can read the whole thing, but pages 6 to 13 and uh, 29 to 35 are especially good. <clears throat> the Psalms are protests against human indifference and injustice. They are a refusal to accept evil. They are motivated not by a desire for revenge, but by a zeal to glorify God's name. Hence, it is fitting for the righteous to rejoice when they shall see God's vengeance on evil, because in this way, God's name and his justice are restored to the world. And you read that in Psalm 58, 10 to 11. <clears throat> the Psalms obligate people to raise their voices against evil and to seek the coming of the, God's kingdom in its fullness. In the Psalms, we are given assurance of divine comfort and deliverance. The Lord will arise. Here's a little bit from uh, the, uh, the Mount of Blessings. When men shall revile you and persecute you, said Jesus, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. And he pointed uh, his hearers to the prophets who spoke in the names of the Lord uh, as an example of the suffering, affliction, and of patience. And we can read James 5.10. Abel was the very first Christian uh, of Adam's children, but died uh, a martyr. Enoch walked with the Lord, and the world knew him not. Noah was mocked as a fantastic, a fanatic and an alarmist. And others had uh, trials of cruel uh, mockings and scourgings, yet even, even more uh, bonds of imprisonment. Others were tortured, uh, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Hebrews 11, 35 and 36. There's a whole list in there. Because of the painful realization uh, of the evil of the world, I uh, can cause no one to wonder, uh, can cause one to wonder whether the Lord actually reigns. Now, how can we grow uh, an unshakable faith uh, that we stand strong uh, even under temptation? That's a good question for today. <laughs> you can phrase it a little better. Uh, what is it, uh, that is, what must we focus on in order to maintain uh, our faith in God's love and goodness and power? Definitely don't focus on the problem that's happening right now. Uh, and what should the cross say to us about God and his character? So good questions for today's devotion time. Uh, why is it important not to rely on human means? leaders, institutions, social movements, the government uh, as an ultimate uh, wisdom and solution for justice in the world, uh, but rely solely on God's word and judgment. Uh, a little hint there, all these other things are humans and they're weak and God is not.
Uh, another question, what are the practical implications of the truth that the sanctuary is the place of divine judgment? So uh, how, how does that affect us? Uh, talk about those today. And how can we understand the harsh language of some of the Psalms? Remember, these people had gone through a lot. Uh, and how does the language help us to relate to the humanity of those who wrote? I mean, no matter how hard they got, they left it up to God, right? So that's our uh, that's our readings for today. Stop sharing. I hope uh, I hope you did your lesson this week, and this was just a review. But if not, I, I thank you for uh, going through it with me. Uh, let's have our word of closing prayer. I want to thank you all for being here this week, and invite you back for next week. But Heavenly Father, may the, on this blessed Sabbath day, may our hearts and our minds be attuned to you. May our thoughts be uh, always uh, toward you, and not this world. May we set our, our goal uh, of bringing others uh, into the kingdom so that we can have eternity with, with those around us. Uh, I ask blessings on the families represented here, and I ask that uh, we would have a deeper understanding of you as we praise you through the book of praises, the book of Psalms. My prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all, and I uh, hope to see you next week.